just want to, you know, tell everybody what Invirtuo is. So Invirtuo is a new virtual reality med medical education platform, but more so it's a community for people in the health sciences to come together, um, share information, share experiences, and really just become familiar with a new kind of space and a new kind of platform that we strongly believe will be more prominent in the near future. Um, today, I'm pretty excited to welcome a very close friend of ours and esteemed colleague, Dr. Mohamed el -Amir. He's over here on uh, stage right. There we are. So Dr. el um is actually a good friend of one of our co-founders, Dr. Omar, who will be joining us in just a minute. And um, let me tell you a little bit about him. So Dr. el -Amir, uh, is going to be talking about the biology of aging today. He is an Aviv Clinics physician with over eight years of experience in internal medicine. Prior to joining Aviv Clinics, he spent five years practicing internal medicine at the MM Jersey City Breathing Center while owning and running his own medical spa in Jersey City, New Jersey. He graduated from Rutgers University prior to attending St. Matthews University School of Medicine. He completed his internal medicine internship and residency at the RWJ Barnabas Jersey City Medical Center program, where he was chief resident and member of the ethics committee. He's also a fellow of the American Board of Internal Medicine, and he now heads the Aviv program uh, in Central Florida. So without further ado, uh, actually first, I would just like to kind of kindly remind everyone that the slides up here um, they do, if you point and click on them, they do advance. So I just ask that you try not to click on them so that Dr. Elamir can advance at his own pace. But uh, uh, yeah, without further ado, Dr. Elamir, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you Dr. Addis. Well, thank you everybody for joining me and uh, thank you for coming so late in the evening as well if you're in the East Coast. Uh, I'm Dr. Mo with the clinic. So if you want to call me Dr. Feel free to do that as well. We're going to talk about the biology and um, we have the kind of time level, the brain and you know what we can use currently um, as a tool that's been around for hundreds of years and hyperbaric oxygen and using it in a specific protocol, we can actually change the biology of aging in the brain as well as other parts of the body. Um, and then we're going to go over some clinical results. So just a little bit about me. You guys know that already. I hate the picture anyway, so we'll skip it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we've all consulted Dr. Google in our lives, whether it was medical school or currently in practice, or if, you know, if you're just you know, at home and you're not sure what itches or what hurts. But Dr. Google, if you ask what uh, aging is, he's going to tell you the progression from the death. Obviously, we know it's a lot more than that. Um, but what actually happens on a cellular level during the aging process? So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about senescence, telomere attrition, mitochondrial dysfunction, and then stem cell exhaustion. Those key things are what happens. Looks at the function of all the brain cells. So what we have is three patients. The left one is normal. And the colors represent metabolic function of the brain, where black and blue is the lowest level of brain tissue and brain function. So why does a normal brain have so much black and blue in the middle? Well, remember those ventricles, those fluid-filled spaces? That's what that is. And fluid has the brain activity, obviously. So that's normal. That's a normal pattern of the ventricles. But around that black and blue, you see a good distribution of a little bit of green. That's kind of low brain function. But yellow is good and red is the best. So this is what a spec scan looks like for a normal adult. Now let's go to somebody with mild cognitive impairment. They don't quite have dementia, they don't quite have Alzheimer's, but they are a little bit more than just forgetful. This is more than just the aging process. The two things that I notice are, look at the ventricles, they're much bigger. Again, because of that atrophy and shrinkage of brain tissue around it. But then the brain function around the ventricles, there isn't as much red, a lot more green. That means this person is having less cognitive function, and that's resulting in that mild cognitive impairment diagnosis. And then the final thing, to that progression is Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, the ventricles are huge because there's significant shrinkage. And then the rest of the brain, now there's even blue and green, not much red. 
So this is why our Alzheimer's patients have significant memory issues. Now, one other thing about Alzheimer's, the weight of an Alzheimer's brain is two thirds the size of a healthy brain. That's how much atrophy happens in somebody with Alzheimer's. And remember, you know, with Alzheimer's disease, we focus on the plaque buildup, the amyloid plaque or the tau proteins that accumulate. But that's really the result of the disease process. The actual disease process in Alzheimer's, and this is something relatively new, is actually microvascular changes over time. If you don't have enough blood flow flowing through the brain, you're going to have atrophy and shrinkage and a specific structure called the hippocampus responsible for memory and attention and emotional stability gets extra destroyed in Alzheimer's. But if you don't have good blood flow going in and going out, that will lead to an increased abundance of waste products in the brain, including those tau proteins and plaques. So if you can address the blood flow earlier in the disease process, then you're going to have significant improvement. Now, the, the cost of aging. There are a lot of costs when it comes to aging. And, you know, a lot of us in the medical field are familiar with, you know, when a patient gets to that Alzheimer's stage or somebody needs help, they need home care. That could cost $1,000 a week. Adult daycare could cost $75 a day. Assisted living could cost $50,000 a year. And being in a nursing home could cost over $100,000 a year. Now, these numbers, frankly, are a little outdated. This is from the CDC website in 2016. You know, inflation is always in the news nowadays, but so add just a few thousand dollars to everything here, pretty much. As important as the cost is, the toll on a caregiver, I think, is more significant. You know, all of us have probably had a loved one or a friend going through a significant disease, whether, whether it's cancer or stroke or dementia. So our caregivers are really bearing the toll from these diseases. So who are those caregiver, caregivers? Most of them are 65 years and older. So usually it's a spouse or a, a partner. Two, two thirds of them are women. So men in the audience, we are the inferior species. Our women need to help us as we age. Now, one third of dementia caregivers are daughters. So if you have kids, the daughter is probably going to take care of you in the long run, not your son. And then one quarter of dementia caregivers are in the sandwich generation. That's basically you're taking care care of your parents and your kids, and you kind of kind of take care of both generations. You're sandwiched in between all this. So if we can help, help prevent these changes cognitively or physiologically, we can help not just that individual, but we can help everybody involved in their care. So we've talked about this process. You know, we've focused a lot on those microvascular changes, but we kind of mentioned a little bit about cellular disturbance and senescence. So how do we reverse this biological process? Well, we have a four-step process that we recognize. First, to have any change, you have to have a motivation or a trigger to have, initiate that change in the, in the body and brain. So, so first, we have to talk about that trigger. And then, as if you were watching this video on the side, stem cells. Stem cells, I know some of our lectures you know, here in the past talked about stem cell treatments in the orthopedic world. Well, stem cells are blank cells that can become any cell we want, want them to be. But if we need to regenerate brain tissue, is that possible? In medical school, we thought it wasn't. But now, I'm going to show you that it actually is. And then the whole time, you know, majority of time, we were talking about loss of blood vessels in the brain and the body. So what happens if we can build new ones? Can that help not just treat, but prevent further decline? And then, of course, whenever you grow anything, you need an appropriate supporting environment to foster that change. So this is the four-step process that I'm going to talk about. So step one, how do we trigger everything? And I'm going to talk about a technology called hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Hyperbaric therapy has been around for hundreds of years. Scuba diving accidents, carbon monoxide poisoning, often people associated with wound care. But if you use hyperbarics in a very specific protocol, you can actually make change in the brain and in the body. So um, there's two things that we can use with oxygen. First, as we age, since we lose the microvasculature in the brain and the body, we're losing oxygen. So can we increase the oxygen concentration in the brain and the body? The answer is yes. That is actually one of the oldest and tried and true principles. And I'm going to take everybody back to high school physics. Henry's law states that a gas under pressure increases the concentration of that gas. So if we're talking about oxygen, we can use hyperbaric oxygen therapy to increase oxygen in the body. 
That we've known about for hundreds of years. But number two is what's relatively new. And for the past 15 years with our company and our research, we've discovered that if you fluctuate oxygen levels in a specific protocol, then you can actually generate new stem cells and you can actually enhance a regenerative process. So if you Google hyperbaric oxygen, you're probably gonna see a picture like this. This is a monochamber. This is the classic standard kind of idea when it comes to hyperbarics. Somebody is laying down in a tube and they are pressurized with oxygen. So 100% oxygen is pumped into that chamber. So this person is breathing 100% oxygen under pressure. Um, you know, the pressure is usually measured in a term called atmospheres. So what we use is 2.0 atmospheres to breathe 100% oxygen. And when you breathe 100% oxygen on 2.0 atmospheres, you're increasing the oxygen concentration in your body 17 times higher. But we don't use this kind of chamber. What we use is something called a multi-place chamber. And there it is. So almost looks like an airplane fuselage or somebody told me a fancy submarine. I've never been in a submarine, but I'll take the word for it. But this vessel basically is able to increase the pressure while you're breathing oxygen via a mask. So people are given their individual mask Alexa, for their own lights. oxygen. I'm sorry, did somebody say something about lights? Sorry. <laughs> I think no, someone's that's okay. I wasn't sure if the, I needed to brighten anything. <laughs> well, but yes, there are lights in here. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me explain a key difference between monochambers and multi-place chambers. Monochambers, you're breathing that 100% oxygen all the time because the little chamber is pressurized with oxygen. Here in this chamber, the chamber is pressurized with normal air, 21% oxygen. Each individual is given an oxygen mask. So they are in control of if they're breathing 100% oxygen or if they're just breathing normal ambient air. And that is the key because in a normal blood vessel, you have red blood cells that transport the oxygen. So what I usually do live, and we'll try it virtually, everybody take a nice deep breath in and out. Good. You all took 21% oxygen into the lungs. The little capillaries in your lungs have red blood cells that capture that oxygen, and then they go downstream to deliver that oxygen to your organs, whether it's the brain, the heart, the kidneys. But let's say you have a partial stricture, not a complete blockage, but a small stricture, small enough where those red blood cells can't cross, but the plasma or the water of your blood can. So what happens is because those red blood cells are responsible for carrying the oxygen and they can't cross, you're going to have slow cell death over time because they're unable to deliver it. Now with hyperbarics, because you're breathing 100% oxygen in 2.0 atmospheres of pressure, you're increasing the concentration of oxygen so high that you don't have to rely on the red blood cells to transport that oxygen past the stricture. The oxygen can dissolve directly in the plasma of the blood or the water of the blood. So if there's a small stricture where plasma can still go, you can still deliver oxygen, but it can also deliver oxygen directly to the cells that need it. So this is great. Now you don't have to worry about these strictures. The problem is this relies on breathing 100% oxygen under pressure. And you're not going to live in that chamber forever, as nice as it looks. So this is where the last 15 years of research has come to demonstrate hyperbaric oxygen in a specific protocol. There's a principle called the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. And what it states is that when the body senses a low oxygen state, it's anticipating cell death. So in that anticipation, it will try to release factors to heal itself. The Nobel Prize in 2019 was actually awarded for the discovery of a molecule called hypoxia-induced factor, HIF, or HIF, as I call it. And HIF factor gets released, oops, HIF factor gets released in a hypoxic state, and it can help with stem cell proliferation. The problem is I don't want to put you in a low oxygen state because then you're actually going to have cell death and I'm going to lose my medical license. I don't want that. My wife will divorce me. <laughs> but <laughs> it turns out that HIF gets released only when the body senses a low oxygen state. So what we do is we have you breathe 100% oxygen with a mask in a hyperbaric environment, getting your oxygen level so high, 17 times higher, that... It's good at that point, but when I have you take the mask off for a five minute air break, remember the ambient air in the chamber is 21% oxygen. So it's normal, but relative to that high oxygen that you had when the mask was on, 
it tricks the body, making it think it's in a low oxygen state. So doing intermittent hyperoxia will trick the body to produce these factors to grow new stem cells, grow new blood vessels, and start healing the body. And that's the trick. So we did a study where we took people 55 years and older. And remember, you're born with your stem cells and you're growing and you have plenty of stem cells until you're about 30 years old. And after the age of 30, your stem cells decline significantly. So we took a study with 55 years and older in, as the study participants and measured their stem cell levels pre-HBOT before hyperbarics. And of course, they're over 55, so they're gonna have low stem cells. Then we put them through 30 sessions of hyperbaric oxygen, and the stem cell levels went up significantly. And then the magic number turns out that 60 treatments or 60 dives, as we call it, two hours a day, five days a week for 12 weeks will not only get your hyperbaric, your, uh, I'm sorry, your stem cell levels significantly higher, but even after the 12 week protocol, your stem cell levels will continue to go up. So why is that important? As we mentioned, stem cells can become any cell we want them to be. So if you need more nerves, blood cells, muscle, cardiac tissue, liver, et cetera, that's what we can do. So here's a life, real life example. This is a perfusion MRI of somebody with mild cognitive impairment. And the colors represent blood flow throughout the brain. In the frontal lobe and the temporal and parietal lobes, you see there's a lot of blue, not much yellow or red. And then after the 60 dives, after the 12 week protocol with the hyperbarics that we just described, when we repeated the scan, look at that. Wherever there is blue, there's green. Green now yellow, yellow now red. We significantly improved the cerebral blood flow in the white matter and gray matter. And in those specific areas of the brain, we improved attention, memory, and overall cognitive function. So another example, let's say you've had traumatic brain injury, a concussion, maybe high school sports or a car accident. Up here on the top row is somebody's brain in different places showing cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. As a result, they have significantly low flow and volume from their traumatic brain injury. So there's a lot of green and blue, not much yellow or red. The second row is their flow and volume after 12 weeks of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And look at the color changes again. This is the result of growing new blood vessels. Simple physics, you can only improve blood flow and blood volume by growing new blood vessels in the brain. This is huge. Now, not only can you treat, but you can prevent injury and damage over time. There's a special sequence on an MRI called DTI. This is something relatively new in, in radiology. And DTI basically has the ability to measure the nerve fiber tract connections in the brain, as well as the connectivity and the density. So what we were able to do in Alzheimer's patients is look at the hippocampus and see, can we increase the connectivity and the density of these nerve fiber tracks. All right. So as you can see, time zero in this Alzheimer's patient and then a few months after we saw a decline in their nerve fiber tracks in the hippocampus as expected because they have Alzheimer's. And then we put them through the hyperbarics and we see significant improvement. That significant improvement means we grew new cells in the brain. This is something that debunked what I learned in medical school. So as a result, we took those people in the study and we said, okay, we see changes in the brain in the scans, but does it actually lead to cognitive improvement? And sure enough, it does. It improved overall cognitive function, memory, executive function, attention. And then in addition, there's something in the aging process called telomeres. Telomeres are protective caps on the ends of your chromosomes. Your chromosomes hold all your DNA. And as you age, those telomere caps protect the DNA through the aging process. The problem is they can get too short. And when they're too short, it sends a signal to the chromosome to say, hey, don't divide, stop being productive. Because if you divide one more time, you could have damage to the DNA and that's catastrophic. The problem is these cells go from healthy productive cells to what we call aged senescent cells. Senescent cells cause damage as we age, and they're related for our age-related chronic diseases and even some cancers. So we did a study where we did this protocol, and one of those factors actually lengthens the telomere caps. We checked four different types of cells and measured their baseline and their post-test or post-treatment telomere lengths. And if you see, there's a significant increase on all of them. On average, a 
50% increase in these telomere lengths. If you extrapolate the rate of decline on these telomeres and you increase them by 37%, that's like reversing the age of the cell by 25 years. And I know what you're thinking. The answer is no, I'm not going to make you 25 years younger. But if I can improve the lengths of your telomeres, keep them in the healthy productive stage longer versus that damaging senescent stage, that will be better for your health span as you age. Some other examples of just changes in perfusion in the brain, um, but I know we focus on the brain a lot here, and that's what we do frequently, but there are other organs that we can improve blood flow. For example, the cardiac tissue. This is somebody with cardiac myocardial dysfunction from time zero to right before the treatment, and then after the treatment, we significantly improve the myocardial blood flow. Another example is the kidneys. We have stage three kidney disease. You can barely see the perfusion fusion through the kidneys before versus after the 12-week protocol, we got them from stage three to stage one kidney disease. And just in case you fell asleep, here's the male penis before versus after. And the answer is no, I did not give the patient Viagra and retake the MRI. This is after 12 weeks of hyperbaric therapy, no medications. There we go. There's the applause that I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> and you get the point. The whole thing is, can I grow new blood vessels? Can I grow new stem cells to help different organs? And the answer is yes. So we measured a lot of things. We measured cognitive changes. We put people on CPETs to see their aerobic performance. So we improved their VO2 max and anaerobic threshold. We improved their energy levels, sexual performance. We just went over why. Sleep quality, reduction in pain, overall satisfaction. All of those were achieved in the hyperbaric group versus the control. So this is a picture of one of our chambers. And uh, we have four of these in our clinic. Before anybody is allowed to even do the treatment, they go through what we call our Aviv medical program. So I do three days of testing. I want to see your brain. I want to see your cognitive tests, your biomarkers in the blood. I want to see your body composition and your genetics and telomere lengths. So that way I can really assess where your aging process is so that way I have a good baseline to work from. Once I progress you to the treatment, you do the hyperbaric oxygen two hours a day, five days a week for 12 weeks, totaling 60 treatments or 60 dives. And in addition to that, we want to maximize your results. So you'll see our dietitian to help with your nutrition. You'll work with the physical performance team. You'll work with the cognitive and the neurocognitive team to improve your cognition. After the 12-week treatment, I repeat that same three-day analysis. So I can do a whole presentation for you. I'll show you your brain, your cognitive tests, uh, your telomere lengths, and show those improvements. So some people ask, okay, what other diseases can you treat? So we do age-related changes, not just cognitively, but physical, mild cognitive impairment, post-concussion syndrome and traumatic brain injury, stroke, Lyme disease, fibromyalgia, PTSD, and our most recent indication is long COVID. We recognize the changes in COVID, you know, in acute COVID infection, but those consequences last much longer. Um, so we actually have a study that we just published uh, last month on uh, using the same protocol that I just described today to help the brain and the body of somebody suffering from long COVID. Um, so maybe one day I'll give a lecture on that one specifically. That being said, I, uh, I've been told I talk too much sometimes, so I want to give you guys a chance to answer, uh, to ask any questions. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Elamir. I'm actually, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to start unmuting people. Uh, if you guys have any questions or anything you want to chime in to say, I'm gonna you're gonna get a request from me to unmute. Don't worry, we won't judge. Maybe a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, in the meantime, I guess I do have a few questions. Uh, um, I feel like you know, as with most things in medicine, you're gonna especially anything that's progressive or, or like uh, new, you're going to have a number of naysayers. What kind of um, scrutiny or, 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 or criticism do you guys typically encounter in terms of like people questioning like, oh, is this working? Is it bad? Or, yeah. you know, yeah. What kind of criticism do you guys get? For sure. You know, I think um, the world of hyperbarics has a lot of amazing people, but it also has a lot of sham artists and snake oil salesmen. Um, Real medical hyperbarics are the two pictures I showed you, the large multi-place chambers and the hard mono chambers. Um, unfortunately, you have a lot of people that have soft chambers and tents that you can have at home. The athletic world, you know, you see LeBron James and a lot of athletes have, you know, little hyperbaric chambers that they can take with them. 
Um, I heard when the NBA went to the bubble in Orlando, LeBron had his own soft chamber in his hotel room. You know, there might be some little anti-inflammatory things, but not real significant change. So I think that's number one. We're kind of muddled in this world where anybody and their mother can have a hyperbaric chamber, but it's not real. I think the other thing is, you know, we publish all the studies and all of our studies are publicly there. They're published in American journals. They're on our website. So I ask everybody who's interested, go to our website, aviv-clinics.com. Just go to the healthcare professionals tab. You can see all of our studies and you can see them by diagnosis. Um, you know, our most recent study, the long COVID one, was a double-blinded, randomized, controlled, sham controlled uh, study. And that means people went into either the hyperbaric getting actual hyperbaric therapy and how I described it. And then also people went in thinking they got hyperbarics. We actually adjusted pressures to make them have that ear pop sensation, um, but they actually weren't getting the treatment um, and we had great results. So I think with all new therapies, they're going to be uh, copycats that don't do it right. But you, know, you guys are all smart. You're all here learning and you know, you, the, the data is out there for everybody to interpret. You know, I totally agree. And, and I, I think myself, you know, having taken a foray into orthobiologics, there's definitely, you know, it's almost like you're fighting the good fight, right? There's this fair share of people who just say like, ah, not going to work. And, you know, it's a protagonist is nothing without his enemy, I guess. Um, so it kind of motivates you to, to do better and, and to, you know, put out real data and real evidence. Um, but a lot of times I find it's just like, lack of awareness, lack of knowledge. You know, I, I'll talk to some of my, you know, conventional pain management attendings and I'll tell them like, hey, the, you know, you can do bone marrow concentrate for these kinds of things. And they're like, oh, it doesn't work. The data's not there. I'm like, well, the data's there. You just got to look. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's all. So another question for, for you, the, the multi-chamber. Um, at the picture you had there, I saw, you know, a couple of individuals with masks on, they're getting 100% oxygen. And then there was someone who like resembled a, a stewardess almost in there. So she is also experiencing increased pressure in there in that chamber. So you're right. Um, the inside attendant uh, is also experiencing the increased pressure. Uh, so we have limits on how many times they can dive. So we follow the U.S. Navy dive tables. And as we're ascending or decreasing the pressure when the treatment is finished, they go on the oxygen just at the very end. So that way they have an oxygen wash out of the nitrogen so they don't have to worry about the bends or anything. Oh, wow. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. They all go through a um, whole training program and they're all monitored and they have like limits on how many times they can dive. I see. I see. If I were, uh, you know, a physician in the community and I wanted to bring this up with a patient, you know, what is the conversation that you have with them to kind of uh, familiarize them to the idea, what to expect, and how do you manage their expectations, basically? Yeah, um, it always starts with a, a free consultation. So we actually offer free consultations to anybody who's interested in potentially doing the treatment. Um, so they get to meet with me in person, see the clinic, or do it via Zoom. So I can just kind of right off the bat give them an idea of you know, what the process is like, um, and if they have any absolute contraindications right from the get-go, like uh, uh, spontaneous pneumothorax or active seizures or pregnancy, those are the top three reasons why I say right off the bat, I can't treat you. Um, mm. But everybody that comes through has to go through that full assessment. You know, I don't want to just have anybody come in. I want to make sure I have objective data that I can work off of and actually get meaningful results. Okay. Um, I know I'm kind of hot all the questions here, but uh, what kind of, I know you mentioned the top three absolute contraindications, um, pneumothorax, uh, pregnancy, and um, seizures, which that, that's interesting. Um, but are there any mm -hmm. relative contraindications, things that actually kind of weigh risk and benefits with? Yeah. Um, one more kind of absolute contraindication is an active cancer. Because the last thing I wanted to do is grow new blood vessels into the cancer cells. Although I say almost because there actually is some research being done uh, to see certain cancers concomitantly with traditional therapy and hyperbarics to improve the penetration of the chemotherapy, but that's not something we do right now. Um, the most common thing we have to risk, weigh risks and benefits is if you have problems, um, you know, just Sorry, like real diving, uh, tympanic membrane problems. So if you have issues with your mm -hmm. eardrums and you can't equalize, 
you know, going in a high pressure environment, you have to be able to equalize your ears. And if you can't, then you're going to have, you know, stretch of the eardrum. That's something we have to assess before you go in to make sure we know you can equalize your ears. Um, I see. But some people I have structural issues where they need to see an ENT and get uh, Marangata tubes placed. It's a very, very rare occurrence, but that's something to think about. Okay. It, do you offer like headphones or ear, ear, you know, or does that really even yeah. work? Well, so what we do is, um, I mean, you can do headphones just for entertainment and things. Um, but before you go in, we'll kind of make sure you can equalize. And if you have trouble, we actually have a small device that you just put in one nostril that blows air and it pops the ears for you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. But it's, cool. it's a really easy treatment. I mean, it's, you know, just imagine going on an airplane for two hours. There are electronic tablets inside. And what we actually do is do specific brain exercises to stimulate the specific parts of the brain that we notice the most microvascular change. So for some, somebody on one chair, number one, could be doing brain exercises for the left, you know, prefrontal cortex. And then somebody might have a you know visual processing issue so they'll get a lot of occipital lobe stimulation with those exercises so that way the maximum stem cell proliferation and angiogenesis will happen in those parts of the brain i was wondering would does insurance cover this or do the patients pay like with cash yeah that's a great question so hyperbarics is approved for 14 diagnoses now to be covered by insurance and that's the traditional stuff like wound care and carbon monoxide poisoning and things like that um, unfortunately they don't recognize the aging process as a official cms disease um, so and unfortunately as a lot of us in the medical field know they don't like to pay for preventative treatments unfortunately <laughs> um, so as of now it's not currently um, approved by insurance so People do pay, pay cash. Um, we have different price points for different uh, kind of programs. Um, you know, we hope, and based on the research and the communities that we talk to in the, in the field, um, probably traumatic brain injury um, will be one of the first things to be approved. Uh, there's a lot of research, not just from us, but by the Veterans Association and, and other major organizations showing, you know, the effects of traumatic brain injury really respond well to this treatment. So that will probably be the first indication, but um, healthy aging, probably not in our lifetime. Oh man, I have to, I'll have to show this to my, uh, my neurology colleagues at the James Haley VA in Tampa. They have one of the biggest uh, TBI centers in the Southeast. Yeah, for sure. It's a, uh, it's a huge thing. We're, uh, we're actually pushing a lot of our TBI uh, publications in the next few months. So you're going to actually hear a lot more about it. Nice. Uh, where, what locations do you guys have? So, um, where I work in central Florida is the villages. Um, and the villages is about an hour north of Orlando. I actually live outside of Orlando and commute. Uh, um, so the village is the largest retirement community in the United States. It's about 150,000 people projected to be 225 and by 2025, actually. Um, that's our main location in the United States. Um, we have uh, our research and development facility in Tel Aviv, Israel, and uh, another clinic in Dubai that opened uh, just over a year ago. And then we're going to have a fourth location in um, New York, in the west side of Manhattan, opening within two years. All right, so I'm taking my board exams this Saturday, and it's in Orlando. So I'm going to have to make a quick stop <laughs> on my you way know, to Orlando. You, you know what? It's uh, We can kind of get you in a couple extra answers right on, you know, just with the oxygen therapy. <laughs> <laughs> just that last extra push, you know. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> oh, man. I see someone, I think Ashley. Ash, you, uh, you requested to unmute. If you, did you have a question? Maybe, maybe not. That's okay. No worries. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if, you know, again, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Elamir, for taking the time, not only to, you know, come out here, but to venture into this interesting realm that you have to kind of, you know, that we're all kind of getting used to. Uh, I call it getting your virtual sea legs. So again, we thank you for that. Um, everyone, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for us to you know, be exposed to and learn a little bit about a, a new emerging treatment. Well, I guess it's not that new, but it's it's becoming more robust and to give us a like. Oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I would encourage everyone to click the little heart button on your screen that will give this space a like and kind of help us uh, get more front page exposure. Uh, again, this is in virtual. We are a medical education platform in virtual reality, but more so a community for people to come get together and discuss and learn all kinds of cool things. All right, Ashley, I do see you're trying to say something. I, I can't hear you, um, but if you if, if you do have a question, what I would say is find us on uh, on Instagram or LinkedIn, and you can message me directly, and I will certainly relay either put you in touch with Dr. Elamir or or uh, message you directly. Yeah, and I'm happy uh, if you guys want to email me. My email is Mohammed M O H A M M E D at aviv-clinics.com. Uh, also, if you want to get me on Instagram, it's at Dr. Underscore Mo Underscore Elamir. And uh, for sure, looking forward to answering any questions and maybe speaking again sometime in the future. Uh, thank you. Oh, you know what I can do? I can actually um, on your Instagram. There's an option uh, to get a QR code for your Instagram profile. And so oh, I can, I can, if you send that to me, I can render it on stage and, you know, put it up here and leave it. Well, I'll leave everything here, you know, for the week um, for everyone to see and read. And you guys can take a look at the models and so on. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, for coming.